Welcome to the annual African American Institute. My name is Fernalise Henry, and I am a specialist in the Office of African, African American, Latino, Holocaust, and Gender Studies. That's quite a long name. Uh, I want to thank you today for joining me. And today's topic is something that is near to my heart and near to my heritage. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I am from Nicaragua from what we call the East Coast of Nicaragua, which is actually on the, Car uh, on the Caribbean Sea. And I found out about the Garifuna people in doing some work during Black History Month. And as I was talking to my father, I found out that the story of the Garifuna people is actually, actually ties in with our own personal family history. As it turns out, um, my father knows of some of the Garifuna communities um, in Nicaragua, and he has met some Garifuna people. And on top of that, on my mother's side of the family, my grandparents are from an area in Nicaragua called Pearl Lagoon. And I found out through this research that Pearl Lagoon is um, very near uh, three different Garifuna settlements. So as we move through this short history, um, I want to make you understand a couple of things. Um, the first thing is that I am not an ex, uh, expert on the Garifuna people. However, I did read a book written by a Garifuna man to give me a greater understanding. And I did some other research as well. So I would love for you to join me on this journey to learn about this unique group of people that have African and indigenous origins and hopefully you can learn a few new things and pass the information along. So the first thing I'm going to start off here is with a quote that I found as I was doing um, my research. So I was watching this documentary and someone said that the Garifuna redefined what it means to be Black. And this really struck me because when we're looking at the idea of blackness, I think for all of us, whether we are black or not being black, that we have an idea of what it means to be black. And so as we go through, I hope that you learn how the Garifuna redefine what it is to be black or what it means to be black. Um, now, what I also have on the slide are different names. So if you ever see these names in your research or if you hear them in a song or in some form of literature, you'll know that it all refers to the Garifuna people. So you'll see on the top left-hand side, Garingal, Garifuna, and the Black Caribs. Those are all the same words to describe the Garifuna people. And what you see here at the very bottom is a, the Garifuna flag, which I will go over the meaning and the significance of each of the colors of the flag. And of course, we have the continent of Africa. Um, we have drums, which are important in Garifuna culture, and you can't see it here, but um, there is a guitar as well. So music is an important part of Garifuna culture. Okay, so we're going to have a little bit of a history slash geography lesson. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you, I knew in general where the, um, the Garifuna came from or the Black Caribs came from, but I really had to pull out maps. And literally, you know, when your teacher told you in school to point at that particular case, location, I had to do that myself. Now, before I start reading what is on the slide, I'm going, we want to look at the map. So if you see the blue box on the right hand side of your slide, you'll see something that most of us being in South Florida should be very familiar with, right? Puerto Rico. We have a lot of a huge Puerto Rican population um, here in Florida and also in New York and other parts of the United States. But one of the things that I don't think we talk about too much are what are called the Lesser Antilles. So if you see Puerto Rico there at the top and you kind of make a hard right and you keep on going south, those are called the Lesser Antilles. So from St. Kitts going all the way down. And at the very bottom, you'll see a circle and you see Venezuela, which is on the continent of South America. And this is what begins our journey with the Garifuna people. Now the Garifuna people are also known as the Black Caribs. Okay, so they're the Black Caribs. Who were the Caribs? And 
not only who were the Caribs, where did they come from? And in the area that we are honing in on today, which is St. Vincent and, and Bequia, which we are, have circled here on the map in red, um, were there any other groups or indigenous groups or people living there before? Okay, so let's look at the picture at the bottom left-hand side. This is a photograph of some South American Arawak tribes. Now the Arawaks and the Caribs themselves traveled throughout these lesser Antilles and actually throughout the Caribbean. Um, we also have heard, for example, in Puerto Rico of the Taino people. But when we're looking at the island of St. Vincent, where the Black Caribs are mostly associated with, it, the Arawak people were there. Then later on, and some people say it might have been early 1300s, some people say 1400s, we see the Caribs coming in and taking over those islands. Now, how did the Caribs even get to the point where they went to this, the lesser part of the lesser Antilles? Well, the story is that the Caribs migrated across Brazil through the interior of Guyana and to the north until they got to the coast of Venezuela, you see at the bottom of your map. And then they went and traveled through the Caribbean islands. Now, the Caribs occupied the eastern coast of Puerto Rico, the western part of Trinidad, and the Lesser Antilles. Now, what's interesting is that they did not occupy the larger islands. They were very strategic in the locations that they selected. They were known to be a warlike people, and they wanted to make sure that the locations that they secured would be able to um, provide for their particular groups of people. Um, and the, the people who were leading them wanted to make sure that they would have enough resources and supplies and that they were going to be there to stay. So in other words, when they picked a fight or when they wanted to take over an area, they pretty much wanted to ensure uh, that they won. And a lot of the spirit of the Black Caribs, many would say would come from the Carib people that they eventually mixed in with. And so here we have the beginning of a rich history. We have the Caribs coming through eventually from South America, coming through to St. Vincent and landing there. And then some people say that there were Arawak people there as well. So that the Caribs and Arawaks mixed, right? A little bit. And as the black people came in um, originally from Africa, we'll see this mixture um, between the, the Caribs and the Africans and also the Arawak. Now, this is going to be important later on as we discuss the language of the Black Caribs or the Garifuna people. So let's learn a little bit more about the Caribs. And I made this slide because I did not know a lot about them. And so I wanted to make sure uh, because we have very few opportunities to really learn about the Carib people, at least in my experience, that might not be your experience, but it is my experience and I just wanted to share some of the things that I learned. Now, the Caribs I have written down um, that they arrived in the 1400s. Again, some people think that they arrived earlier. So if we wanna put a reference, let's say they arrived a year before uh, Columbus and our year, a hundred years before Columbus and his voyages. So the idea is that they actually weren't there too, you know, like for hundreds of years. Um, before uh, the, the time of the European explorers. Whereas if we look in Central America, we see people like the Aztec and the Maya that had well established themselves um, for a very long period of time before we see the Europeans coming over. Now, one of the interesting things about the, the Caribs and the islands that they inhabited, there was a lot of Carib resistance. So when we're looking at St. Vincent in particular, where the origin of our story starts, we see that St. Vincent was not heavily colonized like other European settlements. And a lot of people say that that has to do with the fact that the Caribs were such a warlike people. So even though we might, might have had some Spanish, Dutch, French, or even English trying to stake a claim to St. Vincent, it really didn't happen until much later on. And we're going to look at that. Uh, they were a warlike and fierce people. They had a social hierarchy, which was headed by an um, Ubuntu, a non-hereditary male that was chosen by the elders. 
And then what's interesting about their social org organization or social hierarchy is that chiefs only emerge during the time of war. So in times of peace, you would have a leader that was chosen by the elders. And then in times of war, we would then have chiefs and they would organize all the fighting and so forth. They had different tribes. Uh, most boys were trained to be warriors and were taken away from their mothers at age four because they thought that if they were taken any time later that the boys would be quote unquote too soft. Uh, they had a very communal way of living. Uh, they had a main idol named Maboya who controlled everything and they also had their own good god called Chememen. They also had an, a great respect for the sea and they had seafaring canoes that traveled. As you see, and we talked about in the previous map, they went from Venezuela, they traveled the sea around those, those islands of the Lesser Antilles. And in the case of us, they eventually settled in St. Vincent. Another thing interesting of, about their society is that they did not eat certain things. They didn't eat mame, which you see a picture there of the mame fruit. They did not eat turtle. Um, or salt or even pig. Um, and interestingly enough, they thought that all of those things made them stupid or kind of silly if they ate that. So they, they tended to stay away from those particular items. All right, so here begins the complicated story. We know the Garifuna people are the Black Caribs. How, when, and where did they come from? All right, so... The one thing about the explorations and discoveries and the, the journeys from Europe is that they had quite a bit of written record. So then we can look at all of these written records and try to figure out where from what part of Africa or the African continent did the Black Caribs, or the ancestors of the Black Caribs come from. So the first time that we see a mention of Black people living on St. Vincent is in 1646 where a Dominican friar named Armand de la Paix mentions Africans living on there in his records. Then in 1661 and 1662, there's a British calendar for state papers. And they said in those papers that the Caribs actually lured in the Spanish ships. They took the gold and the slaves, or they say that the slaves that were on the Spanish ships were shipwrecked and then eventually stayed on the island and mixed in with the Carib people that were already there. Another popular theory is that in 1675, a Dutch ship carrying slaves from the Bight of Benin of West Africa to Barbados um, carried these Africans and they ended up on St. Vincent. Now, here's the thing. The Bight of Benin, if you look on the right, is that circled area, okay? And so bite has to do with a very particular geographic feature. And so they came from this area and that is where they picked up quite a few slaves. Okay. All right, so a bite is a bend or a curve which is often in a crescent shape and it forms an open bay on the coastline. So it's a bend or a curve that forms a sort of a crescent shape that forms an open bay on the coastline. So we're talking about this particular area on that right off of the African um, continent, West Africa. So supposedly this ship ended up, you know, drifting away and then there was a raft or some people say that it was shipwrecked and then a raft with some of the Africans that they brought over from the Benin area would um, take them or took them from Bar Barbados into St. Vincent and also into the area of St. Lucia. So if you take a look at this blue area right here, you'll see Barbados. And then if you make a hard left, it's about 28 nautical miles or 28 miles to St. Vincent. And so what a lot of these um, Africans realized if they were working on plantations, they heard or they saw, you know, the Caribs traveling 
they figured that if they could get on a raft based on the wind pattern and the, the, the patterns of the water and how everything drifted, they would eventually end up on St. Vincent or they would end up on St. Lucia. Now the word was that St. Vincent was the better place to go. So if they drifted away or if they left or if they even escaped from Barbados from that particular ship, they would want to land on St. Vincent. So they, the escape Africans merged with the Caribs and gradually adapted their language. So it could be from many different places, right? So the Africans could have come from that particular ship, right? Coming from the Bight of Benin off of that coastline, that open bay. Um, and then as far as the 1646, 1661, and 1662 accounts, they could have come from any portion of Africa. We are not quite sure. All we know is that there were African people on St. Vincent, and these are just theories as to how they got there. Now, as we move forward and we see other people write about the history of St. Vincent, one of the things that people started to do was to differentiate between the Black Caribs, okay, so the Black Caribs being the Caribs mixed in with these people of African descent, um, from the original or yellow Caribs who arrived or occupied the island. So the yellow were there before the Black Caribs, according to these histories. Now, the Black Caribs would later be known as the Garifuna, and I have their name in red, the Garifuna people. And what's interesting with the Black Caribs is that they occupied the windward side of the island and the yellow caribs occupied the leeward side of the island. So they kind of, in a way, um, just kind of separated themselves or lived in different areas. So when we're looking at the word windward, windward means upwind. So an island's windward side actually faces the prevailing or the trade winds whereas the leeward side faces away from the winds, um, sheltering it from um, the, the, being sheltered from the hills and the mountains. So the windward side is by the trade winds and then the leeward side, they were protected um, by the winds, by the hills and the mountains. So that's how they kind of separated. Now, it's not to say that you didn't have black caribs and yellow caribs living together, like next to each other, but just in general, we eventually see as time goes along that the yellow caribs tended to be on one part of the island and the black caribs tended to be on another part of the island in St. Vincent. All right, and, and as we move along and we move into the mid 17th century and going into the 18th century, we see that the British and the French are going to be, <coughs> excuse me, the major players um, for fight of control of St. Vincent. One of the reasons why they wanted um, to have control of St. Vincent is because of the its location in proximity <coughs> not only to the or where it was in the lesser antilles but also its proximity to um to central america to south america and the land was very nice to farm and to have control of and they had fresh water it became a battleground between the british the french and the natives but we also have the dutch in there at different periods of of time trying to make claims to the island so what we see by uh, um, these european nations is not only are they trying to make claims right in the united states or in north america but they are also trying to make claims um with all of these islands in the caribbean including in the lesser antilles the more islands that you have the more territory you have right the more power that you have so if we go back to the British side, Charles I of England in 1627 actually granted the land to a gentleman by the name of Lord Carlisle. In 1672, Charles II granted it to Lord Willoughby and the Caribs re resisted all of the claims of the British. So when I say the Caribs, I mean all of the Caribs, whether they be the Black Caribs or the Yellow Caribs. Now, by the early 1800s, what we see is that if the Caribs were to choose one side over the other, 
they definitely preferred the French to the British. Um, the British were more despised than the French. The French tended on um, St. Vincent to have smaller settlements, um, but the British made it very clear that they wanted to have complete control of the island. Now, what's interesting is that something that happened in North America actually had an impact in what happened in St. Vincent. And we see an increase or an escalation of the conflict between the British and the French. Now, for those of us who have studied US history, we know that the Treaty of Paris in 1763 ended the French and Indian War, in which the French lost quite a bit of land in North America. And the British were basically the, the major controllers of that area in and around the 13 colonies and especially the Ohio River Valley area. And what we see is that during this Treaty of Paris in 1763, that St. Vincent was ceded to the British, right? So the British win in North America and they're also winning in St. Vincent. Now, the Garifuna actually fought against the British for three decades until 1797. So they were very fierce, um, the, the, the Black Caribs and the Yellow Caribs, in fighting against the influence of the British. And it took them a very long time to take over. So we have two different sets of wars. The first one is the First Carib War, which lasted from 1772 to 1773. Coincidentally, if we're looking at the United States, we'll see that this is when we also see an increase in conflict within the colonies, especially in the Boston area. So what I'm trying to say is, is that the British are dealing with their own problems in the colonies, the 13 colonies, as well as what's happening here in St. Vincent. Now, the Caribs tried to work with the French to seize back the island in 1779, but in just a few more years, again, the um, island was restored to British control with the Treaty of Paris, which ended the American Revolutionary War, officially ended and had the terms of the war in 1783. So we see a battleground with the British being or the British being the most despised, but they ended up taking control of the island, which would have dire uh, consequences for the Black Caribs or the Garifuna people. I, I definitely had to mention jo Joseph Chateaulier. And if you look at the left-hand side, he was a Garifuna tree, uh, chief. So a Black Carib chief who led a revolt against the British in 1795. He is a national hero of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and also Belize. And we'll see how Belize plays a role um, with the Garifuna people here in a moment. And so what we see is this monument or obelisk, um, which stands on Dorchshire um, Hill, where he was killed by the British defending his honor and his way of life in opposition to colonialism. So this is a very important Black um, ga uh, black Carib or Garifuna chief who fought to push the British off the island because remember, they wanted to stay there and they wanted to have their way of life without having um, European control. And on the right is what you would see if you were to go see the, the monument, you would see this plaque that has this inscription. So after the Second Carib War ended in 1797, the Garifuna or Black Caribs are shifted to Roatan Island. So in this red circle, we see St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It's actually right here, but the name is to the left. And they were put on, the story is most of them were put on eight ships. And if you go along this line here, they went all the way here to Roatan, island, which is off the coast of present day Honduras, okay, which coincidentally was um, was not too far from other British held territories in this part of Central America. Now, when the Caribs got the Black Caribs were sent to Roatan, they really did not do well there. It could, the islands were not as rich as St. Vincent and they needed to leave to be able to support their people. They had to go and establish settlements, different settlements. So they went to, you'll see these kind of yellow bursts, to um, settlements on the coast of Belize, 
Guatemala, Honduras, and in Nicaragua. Right. And here I have some depictions. Um, here we have a family. Now remember, most of the Black Caribs were taken off of St. Vincent, but here we have a family of Captain George, who is a Black Carib, and he's right here, and his wife, um, who is a yellow Carib in 1880, and their children. And on the right-hand side, you see a, a, a photograph of a Carib house at St. Vincent in the British West Indies, and they are making baskets. And then at the bottom, we have Garifuna children in present day, I believe, Belize celebrating their Garifuna culture. So just to give you an idea of yellow carobs, black carobs, and what they look like and, and the structures and structures of the home of their, um, well, it's not, that's not a home. That's a place where they gathered, but just to give you an idea of what the carob people look like. All right, so then we move forward here, um, fast forward in history. We now have them settling in those four different areas. And what we see in two specific time periods is a uh, resurgence in Garifuna culture. So over all this time, even though the Garifuna people are literally in, if you include St. Vincent, five different locations, they, are st they still have very strong ties to the Garifuna culture. So between 1960 and 1980, and we focus in Belize because we have a huge, the largest part of the Garifuna um, population it was located in Belize. We have three Garingao or three Garifuna people that are in political office. They started a pageant um, in 1972. In 1977 in Belize, we have the National Garifuna Settlement Day is declared and it is a public and bank holiday. And then we have Dr. Theodore Aranda, who becomes a leader of the United Democratic Party in 1982. And he would be, the this would be the highest political office that a Garifuna a person had held in Belize up to that point. In the 1980s and 1990s, we start seeing radio programs about Garifuna culture. In 1981, we see the National uh, Garifuna Council of Belize is formed. And this is where we see a big shift. So we have them leaving um, St. Vincent in 1797. And here we are in the 1980s and 1990s with the, the Garifuna people being concerned about the preservation of their culture. So they started creating this organizations. And in this case, this organization wanted to enhance the economic, cultural, and social development of the Garingao of Belize. Another interesting thing that they did was to create a flag. So there's three different colors. You have the yellow, the white, and the black. So the yellow um, represents the yellow Caribs, right? The original people who were there before um, the, in St. Vincent, before the Africans or black people came. And then the white represents two different things, uh, according um, to my reading. It could either be the role of the white Europeans um, as far as impacting Garifuna history, or if we go on an even deeper level, the white could stand for the peace that has always eluded the Garifuna people. So the Garifuna people who are scattered, who are transnational, um, you know, they would like to have peace. They would like to all be in a place where they can develop their culture and their language and keep their traditions, but they're all kind of doing it on their own. And I should say in Central America and in the Antilles, but now we see other communities of Garifuna um, in, in parts of the United States as well. And then the Black represents the Black ancestry. Another important part of Garifuna history that it's important to know is that in 2001, there was a UNESCO declaration. And UNESCO is the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. And they proclaim the Garifuna language as a, and I quote, masterpiece, masterpieces of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity. 
So what this is telling us is that the we have this worldwide recognition that the Garifuna culture is so unique and so important that we should try to preserve it. And I love what it says starting in the third line. It has two out, 19 outstanding cultural spaces and forms of expression dif from different regions of the world. The Carifuna language, dance, and music of Belize were among those declared the masterpiece of oral and intangible heritage of humanity. So here we have the Garifuna people who, even though are transnational, they're not in one particular location, have such a unique culture and language that it should be, um, not, I don't want to say required, but it should be encouraged to be developed and and um, amongst the younger people, and it should also be relished and it should be saved um, for future generations. So this is really neat when it comes to the UNESCO declaration. Is this is the significance of the language of the Garifuna people? And as we move on as well, just to give you some other aspects of the Garifuna culture, and you will have access to this presentation, but I just wanted to share this with you. There is a video clip. Um, if you look above the food truck, it's almost, I think like nine or 10 minutes long, um, in which you meet a gentleman who has the only Garifuna food truck in LA. And he talks about how um, the Garifuna culture is expressed through the different types of food. And then here I have different pictures. So we're going to start at the far left. And as we go through, I want you to start thinking about what elements do you think have African or indigenous influences, right? That would represent the, the Black Carib or the Garifuna people. So the first one is sere, and it's a savory coconut and fish soup that's prepared with fresh coconut milk, okra, onion, cilantro, and pan fried fish. And then we have hudut, which is um, a hot bowl, a soup dish with the coconut broth. And it's, it's um, served with the deep fried hold fish and mashed ripen and green plantain as you see there with the, the person with the spoon pressing in on it. So that's the difference with that. And then we have cassava, um, cassava bread that you see that is being made, but it's not like your traditional breads that we might eat here. It's not like the soft and fluffy bread. It's more of um, a chip-like consistency and texture um, that is made from the cassava root. We then have sahu, which is a um, sweet, um, thick drink made from the cassava root and mixed with milk. And we have the cassava pudding, which is made from the root and kind of almost like a gelatin type of texture. And then the top right, we have cassava, which is also known as yuca or manioc. So all of these different elements that you see here have influences from Africa, and have influence from the indigenous um, people, the Arawaks and the Caribs that they encountered. And of course, for those who live in Central America have some Spanish elements as well. I just mentioned that one of the, the savory dishes has cilantro in it, um, which you know has that, that influence. So that is part of the Garifuna food. Now this is not everything, but these are just some of the major expressions of the culture and the reason why this is important to the Garifuna people if they are a transnational people um these are these are things that show that they do have a common culture right by the food that they eat by the language that they speak right and by the traditions that they carry on now we are going to look at the Garifuna language. Now, the Garifuna language actually belongs to the Arawak family of language languages. But what's cool about it, and this is based from their history, is that we have bits and pieces from Arawak, right? Remember I mentioned that was important because the Arawak people were there in St. Vincent before the Caribs came through. We have bits and pieces from the Carib, Caribs, African, Spanish, French and English words. 
Now, when the Carib men started raiding the Arawak villages, they took the Arawak wives. Now, what's interesting is that the wives continued to speak um, their own mother tongue of the Arawak language, and then the men spoke Carib. So even to this day, if you were to look at the Garifuna language, there are some terms that only the women use that have a more Ar Arawak uh, feel to it. And then there are certain terms that only the men use that have a Carib background to it, right? And so that's something that has carried on for hundreds of years. Um, so this language has always been a part of their culture. And one of the things that the, a lot of the Garifuna people are trying to do today, especially for the young kids, is to um, to have them practice the Garifuna language through the arts, whether it be by singing, um, you know, performing, and so on and so forth. The language has a very particular culture. Um, sorry, structure. Um, C V C V C V. Um, for those of you who are into linguistics, languages and linguistics. So that means that any word that they have may begin with a consonant or a verb, but it almost invariably ends with a verb. Um, there has also been a lot of work done to standardize the orthography, meaning how they write the actual language. And what I have on here, when you do get a copy of this presentation, is an example of a young man named Pablo that is going to speak for about a couple of minutes. Um, uh, in Garifuna, it's really interesting to watch and to listen. And if you click a button, you can also get it. You could see the translation in English if you speak English as your primary language, and you can follow along. On the far left, you'll see some examples of the orthography of the Garifuna language. And then if you see in the middle, you can see some of the influences from other countries on the Garifuna language. Um, so the French, interestingly enough, remember we talked about how they kind of really didn't like the British, but they got along somewhat with the French. Um, they had the most influential part of their language as far as the Europeans. Now, if you take a look at some of the words, if you look at a Garifuna word and then you go all the way across, you can see the influence. So you have the Garifuna word, the French word, the English translation, and then you do the same with Spanish and you do the same with English. So there might even be, if you ever hear someone speaking Garifuna, there might even be a couple words that you could pick up and know and understand. So that's really, really interesting. All right, and then we have Garifuna music. As you see here on the top left-hand side, you have a Garifuna man creating um, a drum. So the musical in instruments that are very important are the drums, the maracas, and very recently the guitar and the and turtle shells. And then if and then um, what we have here is some information about the drums. Now there's three different types of drums that are used um, in Garifuna rituals um, and for secular purposes. The smaller drum is called the primero. The larger one is called the segundo. And the third drum that is only used in special uh, religious, um, for religious purposes and for sacred music is, is, um, is, there's a third drum, I apologize, that is used for sacred music. So you have the three, you have the primero, the segundo, and the third drum um, that is used um, for those special occasions. Um, I have an image here of the original turtle shell band, just to show you the influence of turtle shells. And then at the top right hand side, I have a link for you to look at the beginning of what is called Punta Rock, which began in the 1980s. And you can actually look up Punta Music um, today and um, online, and you can listen to that music, which originates from the Garifuna people and the mixture of all their different cultures. So if we look at today at the various populations of the Garifuna people in the United States and in Central America, Los in, um, sorry, New York and New Jersey have the largest population with over 100,000 Garifuna going there. Um, Los Angeles has approximately 15,000. 
We do have some Garifuna in Houston, but we're not sure how many. Less than 11,000 in New Orleans and in Miami, there is a small population, but we don't know how many. And then 5,000 approximately in Chicago. If we look at the Garifuna in Central America, there's about 5,000 in Guatemala, 15 to 24,000 in Belize, 200,000 in Honduras, and about 2,000 in Nicaragua. So again, they were already spread apart, the Black Caribs, the Garifuna people within these places in Central America and a handful in, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. But we also see that many of them have also come to various locations in the United States and they are trying to um, maintain their language and their culture, even though they're spread out even more. All right, so we've now come to the end of our presentation and I hope that you learned um, the rich history of the Garifuna culture and I've barely scratched the surface on their food, um, on their language, on their music. And if you want to learn more, I have attached hyperlinks um, about the Garifuna, including a study guide, um, um, a hyperlink to information about Honduras, um, where we have over 200,000 Garifuna people currently living, um, their countries and cultures, their language and their music. And we have different video clips as well um, that you can watch. So my name is Fernalise Henry, and I want to thank you today for learning about the Garifuna people. If you need um, any information at all, or if you want to follow up with me, my email is fernaliesehenry at palmbeachschools.org. I hope you have a wonderful day, and thank you again for joining us at the Institute.